Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining this informational webinar about the Betty Irene Moore Fellowship for Nurse Leaders and Innovators. My name is Megan Hansen and I'm the Communications Specialist for the program. Before I introduce today's speaker, I'd like to go over a few Zoom features that we'll be using today. Like most webinars, only the host will be speaking. We will be using the chat feature to answer questions. When you have a question, simply go ahead and type it in the chat. Our team is consolidating the questions and tracking them, and we will review and provide answers at the end of the session. Also, we are recording this webinar, and we will send the recording to you in the next day or so. I now want to introduce you to our speaker, Dr. Heather M. Young, who is the National Program Director for the Fellowship. Take it away, Heather. Thanks so much, Megan, and welcome, everyone. So glad you could join us today for this informational webinar about our fellowship program. We're very excited about this opportunity and we're glad that you have shown such interest. It's a really important opportunity that the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation has funded to advance nurse leadership in our country. They're very interested in advancing the next generation of leaders and innovators, and that's what we're here to talk about. In today's session, I'll be giving you an overview of the program, eligibility, the curriculum, and the application process. And as Megan mentioned earlier, please type your questions into the chat and we'll address those at the end of the formal presentation. I'll go through the basics of the program and then we'll entertain questions. Next slide, please. So first I wanna talk about two very special people, Gordon and Betty Moore. They were pictured here on the slide and Gordon just passed away this year in March and Betty still lives in Hawaii. She's in her nineties. Um, Gordon Moore changed the world. He uh, really has done so much to make our lives very different than it would have been without Gordon. He invented the semiconductor and founded Intel. So it, most computers and cell phones and, and washing machines and many appliances have semiconductors in them. And, in, and Intel has really changed the world in the, in the way that we process information and we think about exchange. And his work has really been transformational. Betty, his wife, spent a lot of her life being a family caregiver. She cared for members of her family, and she's also had her own issues. And so she's encountered the healthcare system quite a lot. She had a really important night, one night in a hospital where she was there and a nurse came in and said, here's your insulin. And she said, I'm not diabetic. And the nurse gave her her, her dose of insulin anyway. And Betty suffered from that, um, that error. And the person in the next bed who should have got the insulin also was affected by that mistake. Now, many people would take a negative route when something like that happens, but the Moors didn't. They really thought about it. And they thought about the fact that safety and quality were so important and that nurses really pay, play a vital role in healthcare. And they'd observed that nurses often don't have the power and influence in organizations to change those systems. So they decided to invest, invest some of the strategic systems thinking that Gordon is so well known for, for and bring that to nursing and, and it, it fund us to think and to develop and to grow in ways that we could develop and we could uh, influence healthcare. They started with an initiative in the Bay Area where they funded hospitals to do nurse-led improvements in quality and safety. And then they moved to founding the Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing at UC Davis. And I was honored to be the founding dean of that school. And Elena Siegel, who's on this call as associate director, was one of our founding faculty. The third big initiative is this fellowship. And we're so excited. That this is our national opportunity to accelerate leadership and innovation in nursing. They're really interested in the next generation of leaders, and we are as well. We hope that the people who come into our program, our fellows, are able to increase their leadership capacity, expand their network, their confidence to take creative ideas to fruition, and to make the changes that we all want to see. Next slide, please. So this is our national program office. I'm here and you can, I'm giving uh, Heather Young, the national director um, and Elena Siegel, you'll be hearing from her in a moment. She's our associate director. Monica Esqueda is also on the phone call and she's our program manager and you'll be hearing from her as we go through this conversation. And you already met Megan, um, who's our communication specialist. This team is dedicated to your success and I know that you'll get to know them as well as we go through this process. 
Next slide, please. This is our National Ad Advisory Council, and we are so lucky to have these leaders who are part of our program. They helped us to design the curriculum. They're involved in reviewing all the applications, and um, they are actually very engaged with the fellowship. They come to our annual convocation and meet with fellows. Some of them are teaching in the program, and many of them are mentors as well. So we're so honored that we have these fabulous leaders who are part of this program. We're a partnership, and the partnership is between the Graduate School of Management, next slide please, there we go, and the Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing. Dean Rao Nava is, our, is the Dean and Professor of the Graduate School of Management, and he has worked with us to identify faculty who have expertise that's germane to this program, and together we've designed this curriculum, and they uh, work with us very closely, and you'll get to meet them as we go forward. We also have a number of other faculty that we've engaged from across the country who bring, in, bring, in, bring specific expertise that's very important to our program. Next slide, please. So a little bit about the fellowship. I'd like to suggest that at all times you think about our website and go to the website and look all, look at that as a resource. There's a tremendous amount of detailed information on the website, but I'll tell you a lot about what's on there in this next few minutes. First of all, the fellowship is targeting early to mid-career nursing scholars and innovators, and that means five to 10 years out from your PhD. It's also several elements of the fellowship that are important. There's a innovative curriculum that really focuses on developing leadership and innovation skills. Mentors are critical to the program. You will identify a self-selected mentor when you apply. And then once you're in the program, we will also uh, assign you to a national mentor. We'll work with you to identify someone you admire, someone who can help you with your journey. The fellowship also provides a project funding for a project, $450,000. And it's the equivalent of a small R01 or an R21 in terms of scope and size. It's a two-year project. And there you'll have, we'll be admitting a cohort of about 10 fellows per year. This year we have additional funding, so we'll probably add a few more to the mix. Next slide, please. I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of our program and the curriculum, and I'm going to ask my colleague, Dr. Siegel, to take us through those elements. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, everyone, for being here. We're excited about your interest in learning more about the program. So the fellowship includes several different components, and just at a high level, there's group activities and individual activities, and they all center around our four program objectives. The first is thinking about yourself and understanding one's individual self, yourself as a leader and recognizing the lifelong journey and developing your leadership. Another is around skills to influence systems change. This is not about one-offs, it's not individual, but how do we really have an impact at the broader health system level and use systems thinking to achieve some of those goals. Another is gaining confidence around innovation, taking your ideas all the way to impact and having the, the skills needed to, to build that confidence and to strategically move forward. And then the final of uh, the fourth program objective is around your leadership network, expanding your network with individuals but beyond the most immediate usual suspects that you might have in your network, but really stretching and bringing in a broad array of individuals to help you continue in your development and to move the work around that's so important to you. And so the two major areas of activities, there's lots of things you would do as groups you would have our, be part of our annual convocation, which is, is a hallmark of the year where all the cohorts come together and either with other cohorts or individual cohorts, you have um, a, a number of courses that you will take throughout the week and opportunities to get to know everyone and the faculty and um, our national advisory panel. And then there are online courses and we also have monthly meetings that we're with you for a couple of hours each month on different topics. I'll talk about that a little bit more. On the individual activity side, 
Um, another hallmark of the program is your individual development plan. This is a plan that you put together for the three years using SMART goals and various activities that you'll be engaging in. And it in, involves a lot of reflection and thinking about who you are as a leader and what else you need. It's not just a check the box like a CV and you'll be working closely with us as you update it quarterly, um, but it's an opportunity really um, in, a, in, a, in a very strategic way focus on what do you need to do to advance. And then you also have your research project. They'll have more conversation about that. Mentorship, where that's core to everything that you're doing and will be very involved with your self-selected mentor and the national mentor. And then also your network engagement and how you continue to work with this expanded network that you're developing and maximize the opportunities for yourself. Next slide, please. Here's a snapshot of how we put it all together. So at the annual convocations and the workshops and, and online courses, you'll be introduced to new topics. And sometimes these topics are, thing, are areas that you've not had any exposure to at all. And you'll begin to think about it, begin the application of it, although it'll be very new to you. And there'll be some a push towards self-reflection about what is it about the concepts that make sense and resonate. But we also know that sometimes when you get new content, unless there's some ongoing engagement with it, it may not resonate in the same way. So we come back and revisit those topics again at our monthly meetings and have another opportunity to think about them in new ways. And depending on where you're at with your development, they may begin to take on a new light and there'll be more reflection and application of those concepts. And then we bring in new topics. So the bigger picture is that we read the ideas throughout the program so that you're introduced and you continually have opportunities to further develop your understanding and application. Next slide, please. This is a very busy slide. You can take just a minute to look. We wanted to give you a sense of the breadth and depth of topics that are covered that support each of the program objectives. And you can see there's quite a range. And there's also in the program, there is some overlap. And so when you have, when you're introduced to one topic, it might lead to another one. And you'll see some repetition that helps you think about the topics in new ways. So you can take just a moment and glance through and see the kinds of topics that you'll be introduced to. Next slide, please. And so in summary, overall, the curriculum and all their activities are focused on developing your leadership. It's about your leadership journey and about your capacity to innovate and to think in new and different ways about your work and having impact. The annual convocation in July is core to what we do and it sets the stage for the whole next year and the years that follow. Um, different opportunities for learning through online programs and in-person or, or virtual Zoom meetings. And your fellowship mentors will be core to your development as well. Well, both your self-selected and the program appointed mentors that you'll be working with. And I'm so excited to say that our first inaugural cohort just completed the program. So we have alumni now of the program and we look forward to opportunities for ongoing alumni engagement um, as you go through the program and can engage with them and as you become alum. Next slide, please. Heather, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Elena. I'm going to talk about eligibility and there's two kinds. There's institutional eligibility and then there's applicant eligibility. For institutions, there are two main ways to get into this program. One is to be in an eligible academic nursing program and the list of eligible institutions is on our website so you can take a look there. The second is to be a nursing nurse scientist at a major health system or an organization that has a demonstrated commitment to nursing science innovation and leadership. 
and the chief nursing officer or chief CEO of that organization would write a, write a letter attesting to their commitment to nursing science, innovation, and leadership, and to you as a, as a fellow in your growth in your career. As far as applicants go, the window for applicants this year is between you having a PhD conferred between 2014 and 2019. So we welcome all who've been uh, who received their PhDs during that period. You have to have at least one degree in nursing or nursing science. So this could be having an RN, an undergraduate, bachelor's in nursing, and then a PhD in anthropology, or it could be somebody who's not a nurse but completed a PhD in nursing science. Or it could be a person who has a degree, a degrees in nursing at every level, but you have to have at least one degree that is in nursing. You have to be able to commit at least 30% effort, effective July 1st of the first year, which is 2024, and stay at 30% for three years. So if you have other funding, you have other commitments, you'll need to talk about how you'll, you'll find that time to be able to be committed at 30%. And your letter of support from your from your dean or from your CCNO would have to say that you're released to spend 30% with us. You have to commit as well to come every year in July for the annual convocation. It's a week-long commitment in July, usually mid-July. And then monthly online meetings, they're two-hour meetings, and then also the mentorship and learning activities. So as you can see, it's uh, it's not just about doing a project, it's also about being part of the program. Next slide, please. I'm going to talk a little bit now about the project itself. The project has to generate new knowledge. That's the bottom line. It must address an important question or develop and test an innovative idea. There are different ways that people can do studies. And in fact, we really encourage you to go to our website, and take a look at the fellows that are on the website who've been in the program. We've had 48 fellows so far and a wide array of projects and focuses in their work. And it'll give you a sense of the kinds of things that they've, they've pursued. Um, one model would be a research study similar to a small R01 or an R21. Another might be an evidence-based intervention where you're actually using an implementation science to generate new knowledge about how do you implement and change practice, change policy. The third could be an invention where someone may have an invention, something they wanna improve. They do rapid design, rapid cycle design and document that and generate knowledge about that human-centered design process. So it's, it's a really flexible kind of funding. And the main idea is that you have to generate new knowledge. Mentors are really critical in this program and it's important for you to think about who might be the best mentor for you. Everyone must have a research mentor and that is um, an important element in this program. And some people will come in with two mentors. You might have a person who's focused on mentorship in research and another one who's focused more on leadership in your career. But um, at, at a minimum, you have to have somebody who must have who has that research expertise. They don't need to be at the same institution where you are, and they don't even have to be in your discipline. They need to have the expertise and experience that can inform you and help you on your journey. Mentors are, would be, they can be included on your budget as consultants. Sometimes they're co-investigators and sometimes they're not compensated. It really is up to you and to your mentor how that would be. We will then work with you to identify a national mentor. We work, we identify and think about what else do you need? Who might be helpful in your journey? And then we um, will approach those people once you're in the program and help you to add that expertise to your advisory team. Next slide, please. The budget, Elena, would you like to talk about the budget? I'd be happy to. So the fellowship includes a $500,000 award, 50,000 of that is to your institutions. We do not um, provide indirect. So this 50,000 is um, offered to your institution for them to decide how they're going to use it. So that leaves 450,000 that will be for you for your fellowship program. It must include 30% of your time. And it can also, it will include project expenditure, so what do you need to carry out your proposed research project, and then professional development um, expenditures, 
What do you think you need to help advance your leadership, advance in professional development that can range from different skill sets needed for um, your methods, approaches, new, new ways of thinking that have relevance for you as you continue forward in your career? Next slide. I'm going to talk a little bit about elements of successful applications. Um, in this application, we really are interested in getting to know you and your vision and your ideas about what's important to you as you go on your leadership journey. And that project is part of the leadership journey. It's an opportunity to explore something, do a research project, and use that experience to enhance your ability to lead teams, to lead change, and to create impact. So in your successful application, what you would want to make sure is there is a strong description of your leadership aspirations and your potential to bring innovation to your journey. Now, when we talk about leadership aspirations, we're not talking about roles. So saying I want to be an associate dean for research or I want to be a dean is not a leadership aspiration in the way we're thinking about it. We're interested in knowing what do you want to do in this world? How do you want to change things? What kind of influence do you want to have? So it's about your vision for how is the world going to be different based on your leadership? What do you want to actually accomplish in your career? The second is about a well-developed big picture vision for an important health or healthcare issue with a compelling description of how you aspire to address that issue in your proposed project. You'll see when you look at the application that we don't ask you for a full proposal of your project. You won't be doing it as you would for a typical like an NIH submission um, for the application itself. What you need to do in the application is tell us about what you're interested in looking at. Why is it important? What kind of changes do you hope to make? And you'll be outlining and sketching some of your ideas for your proposal. In the first six months of the program, you'll actually be finalizing and formalizing that proposal. And so by the end of the first six months, you'll have an approved proposal. But this is intentional. We wanted you to come in with your big ideas, benefit from the early parts of the curriculum that really bring in some new skills around human-centered design, around implementation science, and, and other elements. And that we hope that you will incorporate some of those ideas in your methodology and your approach to your question. The third element of a successful application is that there's strong support for you. We are really looking to see that you've found a mentor who's gonna be able to guide you and provide you with the support that you need, that you have an understanding of what you need from your mentor and that in their letter, they're able to say, yep, I can do that and I can give that kind of support. And we also wanna know that your home institution will support you. Not only that they'll make sure you get your 30% time in the fellowship, but that they're committed to your career and committed to you growing your research program. Next slide, please. Some tips for you as you look at the application. We encourage you to get feedback about your application. Read the questions very carefully. They're, they're very thoughtfully crafted to get to the things that we want to know. So get people to look at your application, think about your leadership aspirations and talk about them with others, with colleagues, with peers, and get their feedback. Um, those people who are selected from the first round of applications will be invited for interviews. And we really encourage you to practice talking about it. Communicate your big picture vision for an important health or healthcare issue. You're going to do it in writing for your application, and you would do it verbally in the interview process. So practice. Get feedback from people. You want to think globally about this, how this fellowship will advance your leadership and innovation. It's not sufficient to just say, I want to be a leader and I want to learn more. You need to talk to us a little bit about what is it you're actually looking for. Um, for example, are you interested in learning how to influence people more? Are you interested in learning how to communicate more effectively? What are the kinds of skills and, and ideas that you have about what you want to accomplish being in the fellowship? That kind of specificity will help us to know if there's a fit between what you want and what we can offer. We encourage you that you also talk with your dean or your chief nursing officer about the application and, and with your mentor. Have them look at it and talk it over with you. And get some feedback from people in your professional social networks, if you'd like to, about what they think and get, get their input as you go ahead. 
what we're encouraging you to do is to check, test out your ideas, refine your ideas so that you're ready to participate in the interview process. Next slide, please. So there's some really common budget questions that come up and there's a, a, a frequently asked questions on our website, but Elena, who is our expert on budgeting is gonna to talk to you a little bit about some of these questions. Thank you. Um, the first one, institutional, the 550,000, uh, yes, that should be included in your application budget. Um, your self-selected mentors, it's really about how you, what you work out with them. Yes, they can receive a consultation fee, an honorarium, they could be a co-I. It really does vary and some are not compensated. So it's something that you'll have that conversation with them and see how it fits in with your budget. You are allowed co-investigators. It makes sense. We encourage you to have co-investigators, actually. This is, given the scope of the proposed projects that we're expecting, having a team of experts to work with you on this makes sense. Um, there are no indirects allowed for this program. So that's where the 50,000 comes into play for the institution. Your professional membership dues can be. There's a six section for professional development. And if you have memberships that make sense for you to can be part of for advancing your leadership, your expertise in your area, absolutely. The travel costs for convocation are not included in your budget. We will cover those separately. So you do only include the travel related to your projects and your own professional development. The question about allocating more than 30% time, and I saw that there was a question about this in the chat too. I wanna to just stop for a minute and say what are our bigger pictures. I mean, it's on a case by case. We expect a 30%. And if you're thinking, well, I really need more than that, we'd like you to step back and think about the scope of the project. This is a small, like similar to a small uh, R01 or an R21 and think about what aspects of the proposed project could be delegated or assigned to other team members because you are doing this as part of a team. We are not looking for you to take it all on and have a higher percentage. The goal would be for you to be working with others and engaging as a team and you would be leading the team. So we at this point want you to keep it to 30%. If of course there are extenuating circumstances and you've gone through the exercise of looking at other options, reach out to us and we can have those conversations, but our intent is 30% time. And that also will keep the project within this intended scope. The budget that you're sending in with your application is a preliminary budget. It's your ideas based on right now, what you're proposing. But once you're admitted to the program, in the first several months, you finalize your research project. So you'll have more accurate idea of the budgeted project expenses. You'll, you'll be working on your individual development plan. And so you will have a much better idea on the kinds of expenditures you would like to budget to um, advance your professional development. And so then you'll have an opportunity to update the budget. And then it goes through a review and a approval process. And then annually, as you're expending the funds, as you're looking at how do you use the remaining funds, we you have a chance to update and have it approved again. And there are some policies around getting pre-approvals. Next slide, please. Heather, would you like to jump in here? Thank you, Elena. So uh, I wanna talk a little bit about how to apply the logistics of that. So there's a two part process. There's two elements to this. The first is a Qualtrics application. And you'll, you can go to our website and request a link. What you'll get is a custom save as you go application. So it'll be only available to you. And you can write a little bit, go away, come back, save it, come back later. And so it enables you to, to not have to sit down in one sitting and do it. We also have a PDF of the application on the website. So you can take a look at the entire um, application and some people choose to, to complete it offline and then upload it at the last minute. But we encourage you to get that link early on so that you know that you're in and that you can um, be ready to populate that information. 
And that's answering the questions that we have in our application for you. And then there's a requirement for you to submit a single PDF of, of materials that are the additional materials that we need. And they would include your, your bio sketch, the letters of support that you need from your, your dean or your CNO and from your mentor. Those kinds of materials would be um, those that are additional ones that don't go in the Qualtrics, but they would be um, put together in the order that we ask in a PDF. And then you email them to the website, the email address that's listed on the slide. And your application won't be con considered complete until both elements are there. So go ahead and register for a link as soon as you're up to it. And then, um, then you can start to uh, accumulate the materials and get ready to submit. Next slide, please. I wanna talk a little bit about the timeline. Um, today, you're here on the very first day. This is the day that we opened our applications. And so now they'll be available and you can start to put them together. Uh, they're due the 1st of December by 5 p.m. Pacific time. So we look forward to getting those on the first. Um, then our National Advisory Council is engaged in very intense review together, looking all looking at all of the applications um, and very thoughtfully. And as we, we look at the applications, we identify a pool that we would like to advance for interviews. And those interviews are Zoom interviews. They, they last about an hour and a half. You'll have two segments of the interview, one with the National Program Office staff and one with members of the National Advisory Council. So we notify applicants the week of February 12th about whether you will be invited for an interview or not. And the interviews are going to be between February 27th and 29th. So you might just put a hold on your calendar, mark those dates in case you'll be invited in for an interview. And then mid to late March, we'll notify applicants about their acceptance into the program. And we take a little bit of time to make sure our pool is finalized. And, and then, then in mid-May, we announce publicly the 2024 cohort. June 21st will be our online orientation for that cohort. It's a, it's a several hour event. And so again, you could put a hold on your calendar for that date. And the program officially starts on July 1st. And it'll go through July, June 30th, three years later. And then in mid-July, we'll have an annual convocation in Sacramento, and this is a mandatory attendance. We'll be publishing the dates of those shortly. And when, when that comes out, we'd like you to hold that date as well. Next slide, please. I want to just list our, our Betty R.E. Moore Fellows. We've got so many people who are here in the program already. Um, the cohort 2020 just finished in June, but these are 48 fantastic people who are part of our, our, our fellowship family. And I'd encourage you to take a look at this list. Go to the website. On the website, there's little bios that are videos that each of these fellows has recorded to share a little bit about their experience and they can and they give you some a sense of the work that they're doing as well. This is a helpful uh, tool for you as you plan your application to see the range of kinds of ideas people have and the kinds of issues that they're tackling. So I encourage you to take a look and um, get to know your peers. Feel free to reach out to people who are on this list. I know that they're very generous in providing advice and support to applicants. And from there, we're going to um, just go into the discussion section. I just want to flash the slide so you can see the email where you can always send questions to us. We're happy to answer any specific questions you have that you don't have answered on, on um, in the webinar. And then please take a look at the website and really dig around the website. There's a lot of really good information there. So thank you very much for listening. It's now your turn. And I'm gonna ask Monica and Tasha to tee up questions for us so that we can answer you the questions that are burning for you. Wonderful. Um, so the first question is uh, relating to projects. Are phase zero qualitative approaches acceptable? My research has multi-level policy implications, which is a knowledge gap I would like to fill. Lena, would you like to answer that? I think it's important to, um, I, I would say yes with the caveat. You want to come in with your best ideas. Your, go your goal with the application is to show us what is the gap, what is the health, healthcare, 
issue that you're interested in, why is it important, and what you're thinking. And then we go from there. I would not want to ex have you excluded because you think it might not be far enough along. And actually, with this fellowship, there are um, projects that are funded that may not necessarily fall within NIH funding. So we encourage you to think about what is needed to advance the knowledge and the science in this area. Also look at some of the projects that are on the website from the fellows and look at the, the array of different types of projects and different phases that the work is in. Great, so we have some questions about mentorship. Um, I have two mentors and neither are nursing scientists. Will this look poor to the reviewers? Uh, in addition, my research mentor was a previous K-12 mentor. Will this look poorly? Thank you for that question. We welcome any mentor that's going to be great for you as long as they have the requisite scientific preparation to be able to mentor you well. So they do not have to be in our discipline. They do not have to have PhDs in nursing, but we do expect them to have a PhD. Um, and, and it's okay to have mentors who've been your mentors before. In the application, both you and your mentor are going to be asked to talk about the mentorship relationship and what you're going to get out of it. And so it's vital that you say what it is you'll be learning from this mentor and that your mentor talks about their capacity and interest in supporting you in those areas. If you've been with a mentor before, I think it's really helpful to say, and in this phase of our relationship, we'll be focusing on this now, because we expect that your mentor relationship would have grown if you've been together for a long time. So there's no negative in having a new mentor or an older mentor. The trick is to really talk about what will you do together and how will they enrich your, your journey and what, what do they bring to the partnership? Thank you, Heather. Next question is, is there any specific area of interest you would prioritize for funding? That's a great question. I think one of the, the, the greatest strengths of this program is that it's incredibly open and we are really wanting to invest in the next generation of leaders, which means that as the, as the next generation, you get to set the priorities for what's important. What's gonna matter is how you talk about the importance of your question, the importance of the health issue that you want to address. That's what's gonna be the most vital. There's certainly themes in the fellowship. If you look at what other fellows have explored that are really important. A lot of people have been looking at health equity and looking at the role of technology and health and healthcare, looking at community engaged approaches to improving health. Those are some general themes, but each cohort sort of has their own themes that seem to come out as, as more prominent. But the most important part of this is for you to be able to say, this is an issue that's really important for the health of, of, of people, and how do you particularly want to approach this? So we're, um, I think it's really fun. I love learning so much about people, um, about the programs that people are pursuing. It's across the lifespan, it's across settings, and it's a really rich exchange when we're able to talk with each other about those uh, cross-cutting issues in research and leadership. All right, uh, another question is uh, budget. As a current K awardee, I'd like to understand if there have been instances where past or current fellows integrated their existing K award with this fellowship and their applications. Um, I've been advised to discuss how I plan to manage my time and allocate funds to meet both funding commitments. Should I include this discussion in the proposal section that inquires about institutional support for the project, or is there a more appropriate section for this information? That's a really good question. When you have funding, a K award is especially 70, 75%, and then you're adding 30% time, that's 105, which is not allowed. So you've got to talk about that 5% overlap and we would be definitely looking for you not having any other commitments if you're that committed into major programs. So as you as you put as you respond in the application talking about that commitment and about um, how what's distinct about the fellowship project because you can't just do your K award as your fellowship project it has to be a distinct project so you'll want to distinguish between that it's also helpful if your mentor and even the inst institutional um, leader in their letters mentions the K award and how this will be balanced in terms of your time commitment as well. 
Okay. There's two quick questions that I'm going to answer directly, Heather, just so that, be, so should salary support for 30% effort be included in my budget? Yes. Can budget, can our budgets include travel to conference for leadership building activities like CAN, policy learning and networking? And the answer to that is also yes. Um, that brings us to another mentorship, que mentorship question and it's, it does not appear there are any time commitments of the mentors outside of what we arranged directly with one-on-one -on -one with them. Is that correct? I.e. they are not required to attend convocation or monthly meetings. So Heather, I'll let you elaborate further on that. Um, but there is some meetings that we do have for mentors and Heather can speak more about that. Thanks, Monica. Yes, we have an orientation for mentors where we it's an hour long orientation just to share with them the goals of the program and also what you'll be expected to do on your journey so that they have a sense of that. And then we have mentor meetings twice a year that are also hour long meetings. They're not mandatory for mentors, but we find we get very high attendance. They're very interested in being part of the learning community. And it's a time when we give them updates about the program and information, and they share lessons learned in their mentorship. And I think that the feedback we've heard is they find it really valuable to hear from others who are mentoring in the program as well. So uh, next question, do I have to be a tenure track faculty member to apply? No, you do not have to be a tenure track faculty member. You have to have a commitment to, to research, to nursing science. And that's something you, you would want to talk about and also have your dean um, discuss if you're in a school of nursing uh, so that you or your CNO of a health system so that you can uh, establish that you are committed to this trajectory of, of generating knowledge beyond the fellowship. All right, uh, some application questions. I am housed in a school of public health with a with K99 finding, funding. I can't move to the, to the nursing school listed on the website as my K99 application was submitted to the school of public health. Can I apply through the, as a school of public health, through school of public health? If your organization is on the list as a academic eligible ac eligible academic institution, that would be possible. You would very much need to uh, make sure that that the dean of the School of Public Health writes a letter that's uh, in support of nursing scholarship and that that is supporting your trajectory. Perfect. Uh, some additional application questions about reapplying. So uh, if we have previously reapplied, are we encouraged to apply again? Can you provide, um, that's the question, sorry. If, if you previously applied, are we still encouraged to apply again? Absolutely, we'd love to see your application again. Um, and we encourage that. And there are people who've applied more than once and then get into the program. Um, if you are reapplying, it's very important that you think about what's new since you applied. A year has gone by. You've probably done new things. And then look at the list of, of elements of successful applications that we list on our website and we shared in a letter to you when we let you know that you were not accepted the first time. Um, and then see and ask reviewers to really look at those criteria as they review your application in, in, this, in, this, in this particular round. Um, and, you know, the areas that we see the most um, improvements in people who come back and are successful is that they really honed in on their leadership aspirations and what they think the fellowship itself can offer to them. What's the match between what we offer and what they're looking for? And then also fine tuning and strengthening the statements around the um, the, the program, the health problem, the health issue that's important to you. Great. Um, another question about mentorship. Can I add an additional mentor or co-investigator during the program? Elena? Yes, absolutely. We understand that there could be changes and you learn, learn some things about your project and directions you're taking as you're getting started that inform what you want to do next. And that's one of the benefits with this program. There is some flexibility with that, depending on 
what's involved in the scope of that additional budget amount, you would require approval from us, but I would suggest that you would then check in with us. We can talk about what it is and the rationale for what you're doing and the amount. So there is that opportunity to make revisions to your budget and to your team as you move along based on circumstances. Well, thank you, Lena. Uh, so another project question is, can the project be uh, unrelated to research, for example, centered on nursing education for system change? If so, would a research mentor still be necessary? Absolutely has to focus on research of some kind. We have a broad definition of research, but it, this is not an educational grant. Um, if you are doing educational work, you certainly could do research of scholarship and look at um, research around evaluating and understanding pedagogy and the work and, and, and there are a variety of different topics in that area, but it's not intended to be an education focused fellowship. And that is why a research mentor is required because part of what um, we're expecting you to do is generate new knowledge. Um, another budget question that I can go ahead and respond to really quickly. Can I include sub awards for my collaborators outside of my institution? The answer to that is yes. Um, the, there's an interesting eligibility question. So there are two excellent candidates at our college that are interested in the fellowship. One candidate has 75% funding for the next two years and the other 15% funding for this year only, would you advise that the college select the candidate with less funding as a representative for this application cycle? This brings up a good point. Only one person from each organization can apply. And so part of what will happen is if, if a second person tries to get a, a link for an application, we would let the organization know that they have more than one person asking. So it is important to, uh, to have some sorting process at the home institution to figure out who will be the candidate. And if you're interested, it's important for you to let your dean know that you are looking at this opportunity so in case there are others who are also interested. Um, and then as far as selecting that person, we really encourage you to make that decision based on the criteria that mean the most to you and your organization. Um, and funding wouldn't be the most important criteria. And I think that the most compelling case about the, the issue that the person wants to study and also the leadership aspirations and the potential for leadership would be more important to me than necessarily whether someone has funding or not. Thanks, Heather. Um, another budget question that I will answer is, can the fellowship funding move? Um, the answer to that question is, it depends. We have had fellows take on different positions in the past, and if their organization is able to accept the funding, we are able to move their funding with the exception of the $50,000 uh, in its additional support that goes out during the first year. Uh, but we have had successful instances of fellows switching institutions, taking new positions um, based on you know, their development in the fellowship, and we've been able to move their awards. Uh, Heather, is there anything else you would like to say about that? No, I think that's that's um, that would be it. Okay. Uh, a question about in eligible institutions. How was the selection of eligible institutions done, and have uh, institutions been added to the list in the past. Yes, the the selection was was done in collaboration with the Fellowship National Advisory Council, and we were looking uh, at a number of different criteria uh, that an institution has has strength in nursing science in research, a history of funding, a PhD program. Those kinds of elements are are really important to demonstrate the commitment to nurse scientists and to growing nurse scientists. And over the years, we've had uh, um, different institutions approach us and ask to be considered. And we take that through a process once a year. And at, at the beginning of the application process, we publish the list of eligible institutions. And that's on our website. So you can take a look at who's there. Great. Uh, this is a question sort of about the application process um, and letters of support. Would we need letters of support from community organizations and or health system stakeholders for our project? Or is that something that would come later in the proposal development as part of the program? Yeah, that's not needed for this application. If you take a look on the website, the list of the required documents are there. 
and you don't need to add anything to the list. Project timeline. So can you clarify about the project timeline? I understood you said it was a two-year project within a three-year fellowship. Elena? That is correct. Sure. So you're correct. It is a two-year project in a three-year fellowship. The first six months are your time to be thinking and having your project ideas evolve. So as Heather had mentioned, when you submit your application, you're going to have your general ideas put together of what the issue is, what the problem is that is so important and how you're intending to address it. In that first um, month, you're going to attend our convocation and have lots of content provided and some coursework that make it your thinking going in different ways. And we want you to have time for your thinking to evolve and to meet with your mentors and refine your ideas based on what you're learning in the fellowship. So those first six months give you that time. You'll be submitting your full proposal later in that first six months to start at the end of the six months, so January 1st. Then we expect your project to go for two years. That leaves six months at the end for your dissemination, and we want you to have time for that. And that would be built into your timeline. Um, so Heather, I there's a question, so I'll ask the full question. Um, and it's, can you provide any information about the previous slash expected number of applicants? In general, how many applicants submit annually? What is the breakdown in terms of healthcare orgs versus academic settings? Thank you. Uh, we don't release information about the exact number of, of uh, applica applicants we, because we don't want to discourage people from applying. Um, and it, I can say it's very competitive that there are several number of applicants for every slot that we have. So um, it is a very competitive process. And as far as the breakdown goes, we've tended to have more academically focused uh, applicants than health system applicants. And so far, the ratio has been around uh, 90% or 80 to 85 to 90% of our fellows are academic based. And we're really eager to have health system applicants so that we can um, have that kind of rich discussion and application and a different perspective in our cohorts. Um, all right, so this is a, a, a pretty broad question and, and I'll leave it to both you and Elaine to answer. So uh, what are the overall metrics of success for a Betty Irene Moore Fellowship alumni? Well, you know, part of the program is is developing your own individual development plan, and it's about identifying where you want to grow and how you want to grow as a leader. So it really is about, do you accomplish what you set out to do? And did you figure out new things you wanted to do in the program that you didn't even know you wanted to do when you started and accomplish those kinds of goals? Um, there's not a, a metric that's across the board in terms of that. We really hope that people are able to um, complete their projects and complete them on time and, and have um, valuable information to disseminate with impact. And so that's uh, ultimately what we hope is that our leaders go out and are able to uh, influence practice and policy uh, in, in many, many different ways. Leadership takes many forms and has many faces. And so our goal is to diversify and strengthen the future of nursing leadership in this country. And we know that that will look very different for different people. And we hope to contribute to that strength for the future. Elena, do you want to add anything to that? No, I think that that's it. There's, It's not a cookie cutter approach, but we really want you to be able to dig deeply and envision um, where you see your work going and be able to move toward that and achieve it. Awesome. Um, so I, the next question is about convocation. So my question is about the convocation in July. I have a family vacation planned July 20th through 27th for my mom's 75th birthday. Uh, will that be a conflict? Well, we'll be publishing the dates of convocation shortly in the next couple of months. And so if, if you're unable to attend, that would be a conflict and you shouldn't apply. Um, and so watch closely for the dates. They'll be published before you submit your application. Okie dokie, let me see if there's any other 
questions that aren't super specific. Oh, uh, so with budgets, and I'll talk a little bit about this and then Elena, um, you can elaborate further. So if I budget for something in year one and it turned out to cost more, can I use year two funds to pay for that? Um, and so the my response is it, so it would really, um, you wouldn't get a check ahead of time. You would have to kind of incur that expense, but then you could charge it to the subsequent year to recoup that amount. Um, Elena, do you want to say more about how budgeting works? Sure. I mean, we understand that these are estimates. We encourage you as much as possible up front to as accurately as possible, like you had mentioned data, um, you know, and uh, having access to data could be an issue. So as much as possible, trying to have a clear estimate on what you expect. So there aren't any major surprises, but we do expect some ebb and flow. And there could be some timing difference from one year to the next in when the actual cost is incurred based on your budget. But we have a set payment plan of when your institution will receive each installment. So you would work with your institution on that if you were finding that you were over overall for the uh, installment that you receive. All right, well, we are at time. All right, well, thank you all so much for being here. We're really thrilled that you could join this web webinar. We hope it was helpful for you. We'll send a recording of the session for your reference. And I encourage you to continue to visit the web website for updates. If you haven't yet registered for your custom application link, do so and the link is included in the follow-up email you'll receive in the next day or so. And also please don't hesitate to send your questions to HS Nurse Leaders, and that's also on the website. Thank you all for your time and have a wonderful rest of your day. Take care. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye-bye.